We continue with our reflections around creation. The title this morning is The Wisdom That Comes From God Is Needed. And so the wisdom is represented in these beautiful panels behind me. And when you talk about what's happening, we know we live in a multicultural environment. And so we're going to start reminding ourselves of that. 2020 may be remembered as the moment when humanity drew together as the pandemic and then the Black Lives Matter movement swept across the globe, both demanding profound change and growth. Together with the brewing storm of the climate crisis, these have led to a growing realization that we can't go back to business as usual. We need to seek effective solutions. As the board of a multi-faith society from nine spiritual traditions and several cultures, it seems evident that these changes need to be inclusive and unifying. Healing and recovery in Canada and elsewhere can't be short-sighted or fragmented. It has to take place within a coherent whole. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. For our greatest challenges, those systems are now global. There are now multiple existential threats facing us, some of which didn't exist in mid-20th century. Courageous changes such as those that impelled us forward then are again needed, reforming and updating international institutions to allow them to achieve their original promise. To that end, we would like to offer these thoughts. Interconnection and interdependence, the defining characteristics of our times, have created enormous pressures for effective global governance. The level of organization needed in such fields as health, collective security, environmental stewardship, and basic human rights can't be achieved without redesigning the international institutions to be fit for purpose. The UN Charter, a revolutionary document which begins, We the Peoples, must be given the capacity to carry out the will and safeguard the interests of the world's peoples. Big power politics, partisanship, and narrow interests need to give way to a higher loyalty to humanity itself. Listening to those with knowledge and experience is the first step in moving towards a healthy planet with a just and effective system of global governance. There are already many informed proposals designed to increase the democratic character of our global institutions, offering protection against disproportionate power and bringing the rule of law to the international sphere. It's time to put our house in order so that the world begins to respond to the values and aspirations of the majority of its inhabitants. Our efforts to heal the planet will succeed to the extent that they are aligned with the principles that are the common ground of our spiritual traditions, such as justice, the worth and dignity of every person, and respect and compassion for all life. Those core values are based on a recognition of our essential oneness. What affects the least fortunate of us affects us all. As members of a planetary civilization that must learn to nurture all its children, we have work to do. This includes educating ourselves and joining with others for the impact needed to create enduring, beneficial change. The question, how can we help, is one we all need to ask. The enormous difficulties of this undertaking and the challenging times ahead should be acknowledged. But every global citizen needs to be inspired by positive visions of the better future that is possible. With deep respect for all who are working to bring about that future, we encourage political leaders and citizens everywhere to take up the challenge of healing the world and bringing about a spiritual world civilization that is just, compassionate, inclusive, and respectful of all life.
want to thank the Victoria Multifaith for that. I find, and maybe you do too, when you read the, hear those words, there's no disagreement. We want that, but don't know where to start. It feels overwhelming, that list. I don't know if you watched um, Sir David Attenborough. What a wonderful man and how much he's helped us. And he talks about all the things like overfishing over, over the decades of his work. And so I wanted to bring it all down to one thing we can do. Because we're told over and over again that we're, this is the time for us to do something. And it is God's gift to us to be able to decide for ourselves what to do. And I'd like to suggest what we might do. And that has to do with loving food and hating waste. Our way of eating in the last four decades, say, or more, has changed in some interesting ways. We know recipes now from countries maybe our grandparents had never even heard of. We use spices routinely that maybe we hadn't even known about 30 years ago. Those are the good things. Now, here's the bad thing. We're throwing out too much food. Not just, not just the grocery stores, not just the restaurants, but we are throwing out too much food. Now, I just want to talk about that one little thing, loving food, hating waste. Repeatedly this week, while I researched this sermon, I came across this line. If cows were a nation, they would be the third largest emitter of methane or greenhouse gases in the world after only China and the US. Now, I find that a very interesting statistic, but on behalf of the cows, I have to tell you that if they were the nation, they would have voted a different system into place. Their lives are hellacious. So, loving food, hating waste, what does that mean? Well, it is about the recognition that our current way of living sees billions of dollars of food thrown out. What that means is our landfill, our landfill, the garbage, gets contaminated with food and creates methane, and that is hard on that system. We demand more food, which means more ground is scooped up, more forest is cleared back in order to have grazing places and planting places because we've thrown out half of the cabbage. We need a new one. So we affect not just ourselves. If we just adopt those four words, love, food, hate, waste, we can do things, and it's been proven in areas, counties and cities and countries where they're working hard on this, that it helps people with food insecurity. When we demand that food not be wasted, when we say, this is what we want you to do with that, bread that only has 36 more hours before it's stale, you know, often it's found in bins. Often candy is found by the 100 pound in bins before the stale date. Now, what could we do if we said, we love food? We love food. God help us. We hate waste. We're not going to shop anymore once we hear that this store isn't putting that food that's still got a bit of time left into the system for people who can no longer afford enough food for their families. Inflation is going up. We know the stresses our families are under in North Park. What have we said? We love food. We hate waste. One of the very practical things is we go shopping with a food list so that we don't end up on a whim thinking, oh, I could make something interesting with that. It's on sale. You get it home, it gets to the back of your fridge, and after six weeks, it goes out with that box of spring mix you never opened. So shop with a list. And the second thing that they were saying this, week, this year was shop from your freezer or your fridge or your shelves so that you don't end up with stale dated food which you're not sure you can eat safely. So how does this relate to the wisdom of God? 
I believe it relates very, very linearly. The wisdom of God is that we are to love God and our neighbors. When we love our neighbors enough to make sure that we're working every day doing one thing that increases their food security, that decreases the chances of methane out of the garbage, this is a way of showing our love for God. It's a very simple equation. And it doesn't mean that you have to have a degree in science. I think that most of us would acknowledge we have more food choices than we ever dreamed possible. We have food availability 12 months a year. So what if we came back down a little bit in our demand? Do you remember our book study in Lent about what's good enough for us? What if it's good enough to say, I won't have pineapples out of season? Well, when is there season here? <laughs> yeah, good question. So, how can we do this? How can we start making sure that our extra food is used? And what it is, is this horrible two-phrase, two two-syllable word, leftovers. Right? I mean, I hear people saying, I don't do leftovers. So, so where do you mail them? <laughs> when we um, don't do the produce here, when we don't grow with the, with the pesticides here, but we bring things in, we've really offloaded our, our pollution problem, haven't we? We can look around and say, no, no, I'm just growing whatever because I'm buying stuff that's been grown elsewhere. And out of the, out of the bright lights of our regard, you know, people's lives are still affected by pesticides that are not allowed here. So the wisdom that comes from God is that we would look at each other as brothers and sisters around the world, not as um, haves and have not, because, you know, there are the inconsistency between what our demands are and what our needs are sometimes seems ludicrous. In a spiritually based life, we seek to live a life where decisions are made that maybe aren't our first inclination of looking after ourselves the way we want to without reflection. On a life lived according to spiritual practices, we would consider who is affected by this? And is this an effect that I want to sign up for? So I would encourage you all this week to think of a recipe or a way that you might share with us next week about leftovers. What do you do? How do you make a recipe small enough that you don't end up with leftovers? Right? As we have smaller families, that's difficult. You know, some of us came from families where our mothers made loaves of bread every week. We, we can't do that anymore. So here it is, the wisdom that comes from God comes in a word of caring, that if we were the ones without water, without food, we would find some small shred of encouragement that far, far away on the western coast of Canada, a group of people was trying to make a difference. I have to tell you that Victoria was not part of this last year. Vancouver was, Seattle was, Toronto was. Let's make it happen here next spring in 2023, the week of food awareness, love food, hate waste. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Four words. And so we, there's tons of information out there. There's different ways to come at this. We come at it from a place of faith. We come at it from a place of how can I resource myself through my faith to make a change in my lifestyle that will have a positive impact on people I will never meet. That's the wisdom we need. That's the God who loves us and will encourage us and strengthen us as we go forward. Amen.